Welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange Podcast. Stories by leaders for leaders to help you raise the bar on your own excellence to release the potential inside of you. Now, here's today's podcast. This is Hugh Ballou. Welcome to this episode of the Nonprofit Exchange. And as always, we may have dealt with the topic before, but we got a very unique perspective on it today. So sit down. If you're watching on Facebook, sit down, get a notepad, share it with your friends, because you're going to get some useful ideas today that you can take and implement. So our guest today is Karen Knight. She's a Canadian, lives in the Pacific time zone. So we're separated by three hours time-wise. So Karen, welcome to the Nonprofit Exchange. Please tell our, our, our listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself and your background and your passion for volunteers. Well, the passion's easy. I, I can be as passionate as you want about volunteers and volunteering. I started volunteering when I was about 11 years old. I was visiting my grandmother in her care home and the person who called bingo wasn't able to make it that day and everybody was really upset because nobody wanted to call it themselves because if they did then they couldn't play right <laughs> so i said well all you do is you you pull these balls out of the cage and read them out is that all i have to do so i called bingo for for an afternoon and the the joy and the the thankfulness of everyone just lit a fire in me and I've been volunteering ever since. Volunteering isn't something that's common in, my, or that was common in my family, but it, it really started something with me. And since then, I've gone on to volunteer in a number of different organizations. I've led volunteers. I've led teams of 80, 80 volunteers with people under them as well. Uh, I've I've served on boards of directors. I'm currently the president of a board of director here in in my little town of of Kamloops, and so I've I've kind of seen the whole volunteer world from from 360 degrees. It's just and passion. Oh, I'm passionate. <laughs> I never would have guessed. You know, you yeah, that's pretty evident. <laughs> Right. So I'm joined today, folks, with David Dunworth. He's the board chair, Center Vision Leadership Foundation, and the, the co-host of uh, the Nonprofit Exchange. You can find this at the T H E Nonprofit Exchange dot org. O R G. You can find all the episodes there. This is 350 over eight years, but it's very unique because Karen's got some unique perspectives about volunteers. So you say in your writing that volunteers aren't free. What does that mean? You get a lot of organizations think of volunteers as free labor. They're just people who come in and you can get them to do stuff. But if you want your volunteers to really move the needle on your mission, if you want your mission to, to have, to scale the impact of your mission and make it do more, you have to invest in your volunteers. You don't just take whoever comes in the door and hand them envelopes to stuff. Think about the skills that they have. Think about the, the knowledge that they're bringing in that you can leverage for the benefit of your clients or, or your cause. If the more you can invest in them, if you have someone who is... Um, interested and has a little bit of experience in a particular area, put some money into training them and they can go that much further for you. And they would not only go more for go further for you, but they also are happier with you because they're learning skills. People love to learn. They're, so they're learning something, they're growing while they're with you, which means they're gonna stick around longer. So there's all different ways. Investing in the training of your volunteer coordinator. I mean, that's a huge one. A volunteer coordinator, so many people think of it as a, an entry-level position, but it's a leadership position and it's a senior leadership position. The volunteer coordinator leads more people than just about anybody else in the organization, right? But we think of it as a, as a throwaway job. It's not. 
So invest in making sure your volunteer coordinators or, or volunteer managers, whatever your title, is well trained so that they can lead their volunteers in, in a better way. There's many ways you can invest in volunteers, but if you want a good volunteer team, they're not going to be free. You are spot on. Now, I've I've been at this, um, some people call it consulting, I call it uh, strategic leadership. You know, how, how, where are you going? How are you going to get there? And do you have a written plan? Like a musical conductor, we got the score. So everybody in the orchestra and chorus understands when they're supposed to sing and how loud and how fast and all of that. But we don't do that. And so a uh, strategy is an engagement tool for, for our vast volunteers. So let me, let me throw out some ways that I've experienced what you talk about. So at one point in my life, I was music director at a 12,000 member church. 750 of those people were in the music ministry. And so I never had a day that I went to lunch by myself. Always had lunch with people because, you know, if you ask people to do something, you need to know something about them, what they prefer, or what they're good at, and what they're not good at. And then I took and I had notepads with music ministry on it. And I wrote a handwritten note to somebody every day who actually did something. You would have thought I sent them gold. So is, is, are those some ways that you're thinking about of investing? That's investing in relationship. You're talking about investing in training, but there's multiple ways to invest. So what are, do those fit in your model and are there others? Absolutely. There are dozens of other ways you can invest in, in volunteers. Monetarily is, is only one. Investing time is probably, as you were, you were doing, is probably the most important. Like you said, just build a relationship, get to know them. Even if you have, a, you're part of a large organization and you may have hundreds of volunteers, you can still get to know a little bit about everybody, even if it's just their name, just try and know everybody. And then the you'll learn after a while when you watch people who the natural leaders are within that team. They may not be the ones with the title, but if you ask a question and all heads turn toward one person, that's the natural leader in a team. Right. And, the, and this this goes not just for not for profits, but it goes in any organization. Anytime there's a group of people, the, the one that everybody orients to is the natural leader, no matter what their title is. And if you see who those people are and then you can bring them on and and add to their leadership skills and encourage them, they will bring everyone else with them. So you can, you can, again, it's scaling impact. It's making a bigger difference for the whole organization through, through investing in your volunteers. In this case, investing time, but it can also be investing money. It can be appreciation, simple things. Uh, I was organizing a, a large conference at one point. We had a problem, a couple hundred volunteers. and we were bringing in an, a speaker from, from outside our town. And one of my main volunteers, this, this speaker was his hero. I mean, it was just somebody, he was so pleased this guy was coming. So instead of me going and picking the speaker up from the airport, I sent Joe, right? So he got an hour and plus one-on-one -on -one time with a hero. This is investment right? Joe still talks about, that. <laughs> you know, just something really simple. It doesn't cost anything. It made it actually easier for me because it was one less task I had to do, but, but it just thrilled him. And so it's just simple little ways of investing in your volunteers that make them happier and, and make them more willing to, to dive even deeper into your organization's mission. That is so important. I think we we misunderstand because uh, volunteerism is really philanthropy in its true sense, which philos anthropos, it's the love of humankind. And so we think it's only about money. Now, it's time, talent, and money, right? So we, we encourage people to contribute, and, and especially people that are in memberships like churches or chambers of commerce or, or part of a movement 
it's their it's their duty and delight, so to speak, to show up and to contribute. And the more they contribute, the more they're invested. So when when leaders say, "Well, nobody has a buy-in," well, look in the mirror. Maybe you haven't gotten to know them and given them an opportunity. It, any any connection there? And I'm going to let David formulate a question for you. Knowing why people volunteer is probably the biggest thing. And, and there are a myriad of reasons why people volunteer. Some because they care about your cause, some because they they see a need in their community, some because their best friends volunteering there too and they wanna hang out together. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons, but knowing what that reason is for each volunteer can help you make their contribution even stronger. So, so absolutely bring in as much as you can to, to keep people happy and keep them to feed what they need as well as what, what your organization needs. So David, part of what we, our, our stick is, is teaching volunteers that they are in fact leaders in their channel, right? You're, you're muted, sir. Tell us a little bit more about how you uh, would instruct people like me. I, I you know, have a little volunteer organization. How can I increase the impact that my volunteers have on my mission? Beyond the, what you had just shared about you know, treating them well and giving them you know, invest in time, talent, and treasure, those types of things. Is there anything else? Training. The, the fourth T <laughs> is training. Be willing to 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 train them. Um, find out what they're interested in. Make sure they're well matched to whatever role that that you have them doing. Um, bring in as much. Like I said earlier, people love to learn, and if they get a chance to grow while they're with you, that makes them happier, and they will spend that growth on your organization which again moves that needle on your on your mission another one is and and this gets forgotten a lot especially in organizations that that think of volunteers as, as free labor um, is draw a really clear line between what the actual task is that you're doing and how it affects the mission so if I'm sitting here stuffing envelopes and I'm thinking, okay, our, our mission is to, to end world hunger, how is what I'm doing actually helping? Because that's what people want to do. They want to help. They want to make a difference. But if all they're doing is sitting doing some menial type stuff and they can't see the line, then, then they'll lose, lose faith and they'll, they'll leave. Um, it's a it's that old story about um, the president asking a janitor at NASA what he's do what he was doing, and he said, "Well, I'm helping to put a man on the moon." Right? They drew the line between a small task that may not seem attached to the mission. They make that really clear, and if you can do that, then people are going to to work even harder. And, and and push your mission forward. So make that line really clear. Yeah, that's that's great. You know, uh, that's oftentimes you're right. Oftentimes people forget about that because they get wrapped up in the day to day or whatever. So thank you. That's great. In the uh, busyness, we get caught up in the busyness of what we're doing and not when we don't think strategically. There you go. Yeah, thanks. Well, you know, um, one of the things, uh, there's lots of myths about nonprofit work. There's lots of myths about leadership. And we've inherited some really broken ideas. One of which is like, it's free labor, but it's it's really a collaborative effort. And one of the, and I want to do a follow on with David's question, you know, how, how can volunteers that they perceive themselves as a leader in the organization i'm just reading that into what you say they've they're part of making things happen so leadership is really influence and i've been in organizations where um one person steps up their game 
everybody else takes takes notice and they go, oh, I can do that too. So the influence among leaders in the organization that we call volunteers, if we've given them a channel and celebrate success is pretty massive. You have any experiences you want to share around that topic? Around? Around, right, you... yeah, giving people, it's celebrating basically in a firm. Celebrations. Yeah, in a firm. Um, yeah, lots of experiences, good and bad. <laughs> um, probably a number of organizations. Uh, you hear about appreciation events. And an organization may have 200 volunteers and they throw an appreciation event and 10 people show up, right? <laughs> I think just about all of us have experienced something like that. Part of it is it, to, to make something like that work is, again, you need to talk to your volunteers. I mean, I, I, I know I'm, I'm hammering on this constantly, but you need to be able to know who your volunteers are and talk to them. If you want to do something for your volunteers, find out what they want. Right? Don't just put a, a big event together and they think, oh, a nice splashy event um, with, with dinner and dance and all this, but we would have just preferred a, a backyard barbecue, right? <laughs> or, or something like that. Knowing who, knowing what your volunteers feel like in terms of, of what they're you've heard you've heard of the the phrase people's love language right there's four different types of love language you need uh, and i'm going to write a blog on this i'm going to do that one day is um is you need your to know your volunteers appreciation language what they what means things to them because pulling someone up and saying hey here's our volunteer of the week would or or a month or whatever would make someone like me really happy. It would make someone like my husband crawl under a rock because he doesn't like that, right? He's very private, he doesn't want. So know your volunteer's appreciation language and use that to make their celebrations something that they look forward to. So um, David, I think you and I have experienced some of the shortcomings that well, let's call them blind spots for leaders. So you mentioned the word talk, but the opposite, the other side of that is listening. So the other one, and then over-functioning. Uh, leaders do things, and their excuse is, I need to be willing to do what I ask other people to do. The word is willing. And right. if you're doing something that a volunteer can do, you're robbing them of the opportunity. So one misconception is, is that we talk all the time. Well, are we listening? And two, um, that um, that... Well, we also assume, like you talked about already, they got this gift. We can offer them something because we're sure of their skill set. So we don't walk them into a fan, ask them to do something that they're not really gifted at. So the, the listening piece and then not over-functioning. And then if we've spent time with them, I think that's that's a when, when the leader comes around and spends some time with them, that's one of the biggest affirmations. So you want to come in on any of those threads of, of engagement? Uh, all of them. <laughs> They're, they're all so important is is just knowing who your volunteers are and showing that you really appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I, I recommend to to any leader of volunteers is is when you thank a volunteer and you should thank every volunteer, every shift, every volunteer, every shift. But be as specific as you can. So, for example, saying, hey, thanks, great job is great. But if you can say, hey, thanks for cleaning out the storeroom, it's so much easier to find things now. Everything's going to go so much faster and we'll be able to serve more clients. Do, do you feel the difference? Right. All of a sudden, it's not just a, a, a gen, gen, generic thank you. It's I saw what you did and I can see the benefit of it. And thank you. It, it, it's a whole different feeling. It's it's like your your spouse brings you flowers on Valentine's Day versus your spouse bringing you flowers on some random Wednesday, right? It, there's a different feeling to it. What do you think, David? You know, I, I I'm learning as I'm going here. This is great. Um, 
That's that's so right, you know. And uh, I remember back in nine days when I was actually running a large organization, um, the employees were very distraught. And I came in as a last resort to try and cure this business that was ailing so bad. And it was large. We had almost a thousand people there. Uh, over three quarters of them were were part time intermittent, but the full time employees were. 380 or something like that. Well, over the course of four years, it took me, but I learned everybody's name. I knew three quarters of them about their family and stuff because I paid attention to them. And that club, it was a, a large organization, went from losing money to making money, uh, losing more than a million dollars a year to making more than a million dollars a year. And we didn't really change anything but treat the employees like humans as opposed to workers okay, so i think your point's really culture. really value them it's great are there trends you know and and think like everything else they they change with time are has volunteer trends uh occurred do you see things differently in that realm yeah um probably the one that is is the biggest trend and and has the most impact on not only your your recruitment and retention of volunteers but also on how you manage them is something called micro volunteering um in the past it's kind of like two different restaurant models so one is is a, a regular traditional restaurant you go in you get a menu of of things you can order from you pick what you want and they bring it to you and you get it served in the amounts and and way that the restaurant decides the other model is a buffet style where you go in and you have a vast array and you can have a little bit of this and you get to choose how much and which particular order that you do things in. And traditional volunteering is like the traditional restaurant. You come in, you choose a role, you may have three or four options of, of a role, and then you do that in the location, in the time commitment, in the, in the way that the not-for-profit not decides. But people, especially coming out of the pandemic, people aren't willing to have that anymore. They want more flexibility. So you hear lots of people saying, oh, people aren't volunteering anymore. People care just as passionately about helping the world as they ever have. But they want more say in how they do it and when they do it. So if you can set up, instead of a, a menu of, of roles, set up a buffet of tasks where people can come in um, and, and pick this and this and this because this is what I'm into today. And next time they come in and they'll may pick all different things and, and maybe more. So George, for example, decides one day he's, he's feeling energetic, he's good. Um, he wants to go and, and clean and help with the beach cleanup and he'll be there all morning or all day. But a week later, uh, his hips bothering him today and his grandkids are coming over. So he just wants to, to spend an hour doing admin work. And that's okay. But our regular organizations aren't set up for that. And that's why a lot of them are having trouble recruiting is because they're still focused on the traditional model. So now you, you, you don't have to choose one or the other. Like some restaurants have both a set menu and a buffet. And that's kind of the best way, especially if you have a role that, that requires a lot of training. And then you can keep that as, a, as a, a set menu item. But then have as much as you can in this kind of buffet style where, you can, where your volunteers can pick and choose. And that way, there's that flexibility that people are looking for. And you still get everything done. That is brilliant. That is awesome. Yeah. It, that and the way you framed that, it's you can see the you know your your explanation so visual that it, it makes perfect sense. Why why hasn't that happened 
you know, 50 years ago. So that's great. Thanks. So, so one of the blocks for people, and we hear often, how do I get board members? How do I get this? So I think the language. So when I was president of the, the symphony board here for, for a while, I took me, I, I had 28 people turn me down for the board. So the language for the board, let's deal with that one channel. That's high level leadership. But I asked 28 people to be treasurer and get turned down. So I figured, hmm, I got to change what I'm saying. So give us a sample of an engaging in a conversation that would result from people saying, I want to be on this board. What a lot of people forget is board members are volunteers too. So a lot of the stuff that, that we were talking about in terms of appreciation and training and things like that apply equally well to, to a board member as to a, a regular volunteer. So if we put that in place, another one, like you said, it, it's it's the talking when you when you approach them, think strategically. So so before you go out and ask, know exactly what you are asking for and what you are offering. It's not a one way street. Know what serving on the board can offer or or provide to a potential board member. So, for example, um, I'm, I think I mentioned earlier, I'm on president of, of the board of the Kamloops Therapeutic Riding Association. We use horses to, to help kids with autism. And we, we were, for a long time, we were struggling for, for board members. And when I became president, I approached three different people and all three of them joined. So, and part of it was because when I went there, I would I would go to one of the members, for example, uh, or one of my potential members, and I said, "Listen, this is who we are, and this is what we do. If you, I know that you are trying to to get ahead in your career, having a leadership position such as a board position can show any potential employers." that you have strategic knowledge and you have this understanding. On top of that, you bring a perspective that nobody else on the board has because most of us are 45 plus and most of us are white and you're in your twenties and you're, you're a person of color. You bring a perspective that we need on our board, right? And then I tell her what we need. And by then she was already invested. Right. So tell them what they get as well as what they bring that nobody else brings. And that that will generally make a big difference in, in your ask. So, folks, we're, we're talking to Karen Knight, who obviously has a whole lot of history and data and expertise. And um, we could spend another another 30 minutes talking about all the things that we've all done wrong and we've learned from, but we won't go there right now. That she's got a gold mine. This, these are all what I call leadership blind spots. We've been put into systems that don't understand this, and we just follow the old pattern, the traditional pattern. And you know what? It doesn't work. <laughs> it maybe never worked, but maybe it did it sometime. So you can find Karen at Karen Knight, K-A-R-E-N, K-N-I-G-H-T dot C-A. She's in Canada. And so Karen... Um, the people on the podcast can't see it, but the people watching the video and the others that go there, um, what will they find when they go to your website? They will find a little bit about me. They will, I have a, I don't know how many blogs, well over a hundred blogs, I think, um, on on a wide variety of, of topics, including the, the volunteer buffet. I, I write a new blog every week. Um, information I do, speaking engagements, both online and in person. Um, I have some resources that that might be useful for your volunteer program. And I do other things and I mentor and train volunteer coordinators or, or managers of volunteers, leaders of volunteers, whatever their titles may be, um, and just different ways. And yeah, and here's how you contact me. <laughs> so thank you for putting that up. Yeah, there's a contact page and she's put her phone number and her email there. 
And if you want to visit, she got her address too. So, uh, oh, she... my LinkedIn isn't on there. No, no, I got missed. Listen, I'm on LinkedIn as well. <laughs> she's in British Columbia. And so, uh, Karen, thank you so much for offering such a wealth of useful information today on the nonprofit exchange. And I want to invite listeners to remind them that we do have a private community for nonprofit leaders. It's, it's, uh, nonprofitcommunity.org, nonprofitcommunity.org. You can join there. We have a free level and then we have a pay, you pay a little bit and you get a whole lot of resources. And um, we, we've asked Karen to give us an article for our blog role in, uh, in, the, in the community. So Karen, thank you again for being our guest today on the Nonprofit Exchange. Thank you great. so much great. for having me. It's been yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, your talk today is great. Thank you for the information. Thank you for listening to the Nonprofit Exchange.